I am a practicing Roman Catholic, which, but um, but um, as the joke goes, means I'm not really good at it, but I'm practicing to become better. I am flawed in many ways, and you're not going to find out about how flawed I really am. Sometimes I am tempted to wear a hard hat when I go to mass. Oh, by the way, that taught me that comment that I just used, which I use all the time, taught me to be very careful on social media. You guys, for the most part, you're young and you're very social media savvy. I'm not. I'm 57. I'm old. I'm a dinosaur with social media. And um, I made the mistake of tweeting at a pro-choice politician when he was talking about how, how sorry he felt about the kids that were being held in cages by President Trump. I tweeted at him because he's so vocally pro-choice. I said, it's really good to know that you care about kids, Congressman Kennedy. The mistake was that this was Joseph P. Kennedy III of that tragic family. I said, maybe you wear a pith helmet when you go to mass. Ha ha, like I talk about myself. Well, that was a mistake. The Twitterverse lit up and people were saying, oh, she threatened a congressman. Someone called the Capitol Police on me. They haven't gotten back to me yet, so I think I'm okay. But that has taught me that language matters and context matters. It also taught me to understand why a client would actually call me from the airport and tell me that he was about to take his vacation home when I screamed at him to get back to my office ASAP because before when I was talking to him about taking a vacation home it was a euphemism for deportation and get back here. He thought vacation home was literal. So as you can see my personal history has helped me navigate my professional present. I would like to talk to you about the work that I do and more generally what our views on immigration, liberal, conservative, close the border, let everyone in, say about us. The title is, because I wrote it, I should know this by heart, Neighbor or Stranger, Morality, legality, and how our immigration policy defines us. I'll start with a little bit of background as to, how to, as, as to how I came to immigration. At Villanova, I didn't take one class in immigration, and that's because there was only one class in immigration, and it conflicted with my, uh, my schedule. It was a nighttime seminar taught by a very famous immigration lawyer in the Philadelphia area called Ron Clasco. Should have taken it because in that 1984 to 1987 period where I was at Villanova, immigration was starting to become a hot topic. In fact, it was during that period of time that President Reagan passed or signed what is called the Great Amnesty of 1986, otherwise known as Simpson-Mazzoli, otherwise known as the Immigration Reform and Control Act, which was a true, pure, classic amnesty which basically legalized with almost immediately millions of people who had been living illegally in the United States. It required that they show that they had been physically present here in 1982, pay some back taxes, um, and say that they were sorry for coming in illegally. And basically that was it. And we had a whole new class of legalized Americans, including their children through executive order. That ironically enough, was done under a very conservative president. The Star Wars president, President Reagan, was no one's idea of a liberal. And yet, simpson Mazzoli was one of the more liberal policies, immigration policies, that were passed in the last 50 years. Ironies continue. In 1996, we went from the amnesty, which opened up the doors to a great deal of people, to another administration, Bill Clinton's. Bill Clinton was the Democratic progressive, well, by today's terms, he is an arch conservative. But back then, Bill Clinton was a progressive. And he was the response to 12 years of Republican ownership of the White House. So you would think that President Clinton would have been even more liberal on immigration issues. No. Two of the most restrictive, draconian immigration laws were passed under Bill Clinton and signed by Bill Clinton. 
the Illegal Immigration and Immigrant Responsibility Act of 1996, say that quickly, the Illegal Immigration and Immigrant Responsibility Act of 1996, that's why we call it IRA-IRA. Immigration attorneys call it IRA-IRA. And the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act, and that was passed the same year. Both of those were, um, in some ways, responses to the first World Trade Center bombing, in the, fir the first World Trade Center terror attack in 1993. It stiffened the penalties for immigrants who were illegally living in the United States, and it made it much more difficult for people to get some kind of benefit to be able to live here. It was definitely not an amnesty. And since then, it's been pretty much downhill for illegal immigrants in terms of laws and what types of benefits are available for people who um, either came in illegally across the border or, in the vast majority of cases, individuals who came in legally with a passport and a visa and they got stamped and you know, smiling uh, customs officers, they came in and then they never went home. They overstayed their visas. They're called visa overstays. The vast majority of illegal aliens or undocumented aliens in the United States are visa overstays. They're not people who've come from, you know, across the border. So while I understand and in some ways sympathize with individuals who, who are focused on the border and, and would even support President Trump's desire for a wall, either symbolically or, um, you know, figuratively, the vast majority, the, the, the big problem is people who come in the front door and then never leave, like the man who came to dinner never left. By the time we got to 1996, when all of these things were happening, I had been out of Villanova for about a decade. For the first few years, I taught high school because I, made, I had an epiphany that I hated being a lawyer. I didn't want to be a lawyer. I went through law school, loved law school. Law school was cool, it was great. I really had a good time. I know that makes me weird because not that many people will say, oh, law school, it's like one of the best times of my life, but it was. Um, and then I clerked for a judge on the Superior Court for a year and I adored it. And then I worked for about six months at a law firm and decided I had made a horrific, horrendous mistake with my life. I did not want to be a lawyer. I did not want to deal with tax reassessment of property up in Cheltenham Township. So I taught school. I taught high school. I taught languages. Um, my undergraduate major at Bryn Mawr was French. My minor was Italian. And I also spoke, I took Spanish classes, um, which angered my father. Uh, who said, no, you have to do something, you know, practical, like poli-sci or economics or philosophy. Practical. What kind of a job am I going to get with philosophy? But he thought that languages were going to condemn me to a life in a one-school classroom. Well, who has the last laugh? Nearly a third of my client base is from West Africa and North Africa, where they speak, haha, <laughs> French. So he's looking down right now, and I hope he's aware that I got the last laugh. I drifted into immigration around the same time that O.J. Simpson drifted into the criminal justice system, around 1994, when I met my boss, Joe Rollo. Um, he's here with us today, and um, I'm really glad that he is here. He is one of my dearest friends. He's also a graduate of Villanova, class of 1982. He's actually undergraduate and then Villanova Law School class of, 90, of 82. Um, he was known as Giuseppe when he was here, a native of Italy um, and of Sicily. When he came here, he spoke some English. Not perfectly, he spoke some. Imagine, if you're a law student, how hard it is to grasp the principle, legal principles. When you speak fluent English, imagine how hard it is, how much harder it is, to have to take those principles and somehow translate them from English into your native Italian and then back into English again to give to someone um, on a test. So Joe's stamina and ability to forge forward and to push forward and to get his law degree and to uh, establish his own law firm after having worked two jobs during the day while he went to law school is emblematic for me of what immigration is, what immigration should be, what immigrants are, the immigrant ideal. You work hard, you do your best, you assimilate, and you become an American. 
I started practicing um, law with Joe in 1994, partly because I had spent so much time in the suburbs, and he had an office at the PSFS building in Center City, and I thought, wow, this is so cool. I'm going to be able to go every day to 12th and Market, and you know, Wanamaker's is here, and all this stuff. Well, a year after I joined him, he decided he, we were kicked out of the PSFS building because the Lowe's people bought it, and um, now we're in South Philadelphia. And I was a little hostile for a while, but it's not his fault. But we are down in South Philly, and we've been there for 22 years now. Um, at the beginning, when I started working with Joe, most of our clients were either you fall in love with that guy in a foreign country, and you just have to live with him. And so you petition for him to come here. You get married, and you live your life together. And that husband that you felt, that guy that you fell in love with, who was not a US citizen, he gets his green card. That's a marriage-based petition. There are other family-based petitions where parents sponsor children and children sponsor parents and sisters sponsors, sponsor brothers. We were doing a lot of that. We also did employment-based applications where big businesses or small businesses, even like restaurants and pizzerias, we did a lot of pizzerias because Joe's from Sicily and we knew a lot of Italians, um, who were sponsoring Italians as cooks in our restaurants. It was fun and it was Pretty easy, actually. I didn't have to fight with the government. Um, there was no give and take. It was like, OK, this guy's qualified, um, or this guy's my husband, and here's the paperwork, and here's the money. Approve the case. And they would. With the advent of IRA IRA, I love saying that, IRA IRA and EDPA in 1996, we started doing a lot more of the type of work that I do now which is called removal defense. You're saying, what's removal? Removal is deportation. Removal is kind of like this Orwellian word. You remove a piece of grit from your eye. You remove a poppy seed from your gum. You remove a piece of furniture from a room. You don't remove a person from a country and move them to another country. You do. But we all know that as deportation. Except Ira Ira changed the word. And he who owns the vocabulary owns the topic. <coughs> and so we went from deporting people to removing people, but it felt the same for the person that was on the plane waving goodbye. Little by little, the majority of my cases had me going into courtrooms and trying to figure out a way to keep people here who uh, had families, were married, had kids. Um, but who had come into the country illegally, or had come into the country legally and then let their visas expire. And it became frustrating in some cases because there were very good people that I was representing, um, people without criminal records. Uh, immigration violation is not a criminal violation, it's a civil violation. So although people will say illegal aliens, they haven't violated the penal code or the penal laws. They have violated immigration laws. But it, it was hard because a lot of these people were just you know, hardworking. They were paying taxes either with fake social security numbers or with what was called ITNs, tax ID numbers, which were legitimate and legal, and paying taxes that they would, they'd never get a refund on them um, because for immigration they didn't exist. But for the IRS, they did exist. It's like the one hand doesn't know what the other is doing. I'm not trying to say they were angels. I'm not trying to say that they all deserved to be here. I am not excusing coming into this country illegally. I am saying that you have to sometimes balance the equities. In many cases, a lot of these people were Catholics and Christians going to mass and raising families and just trying to get ahead. And the laws really did not give them very many options. That's why, despite the fact that I am a very strong conservative, and you're probably saying, yeah, we heard that, Christine. You don't have to say that every time. But I am a conservative, OK? That's why, despite the fact that I'm a conservative and, and a registered Republican, and I don't like executive orders and overreach of any type, because I believe in the three branches of government, I applauded President Obama's creation of DACA. Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. In 2012, there were hundreds of thousands of young people living in the United States who, in most cases, had been brought here as babies by their parents. 
or, um, well, at the very least, they had to be here before the age of 16. Otherwise, the law didn't apply to them. These are the dreamers. I call them the low-hanging fruit on the tree of immigration controversy. These are the easy ones. In most cases, the dreamers are indistinguishable from people who were born here. Most of them do not speak with an accent. They speak English fluently with no accent, except Philadelphia accent. They, in many cases, did not even know that they were illegally here. You guys would probably figure out when they discovered that they were not legally here. Anybody have an idea as to what might trigger your, your, uh, your catharsis and realize, uh-oh, I'm illegally here? College loans. Even before that? Driver's yes. Excellent. Driver's licenses. You turn 16, you want a driver's license. What do you need for a driver's license? A social security number. Mom, dad, where's my social security number? Silence. And then it comes out that you're not legally here. And there are cases where, I mean, it's really bizarre because I have known people who, um, parents who have come in illegally, carried a one-year-old child where the mother was pregnant, the mother had the baby in the United States. So there's a one-year difference between an older brother and a younger sister. The younger sister is like me. She's a US citizen. All of the rights and privileges of being a US citizen. We can't deport her. We can't remove her. We can't do anything. Older brother, one-year difference. He is subject to deportation back to a country that he doesn't even know, that he doesn't remember. So that was why DACA was passed. It was a, a form of Passion, balancing justice against compassion. Yes, they made a mistake. They did the wrong thing. In many cases, they didn't know they were doing it. In many cases, that choice was made for them by their parents. And so President Obama um, passed DACA. A lot of people were upset about DACA for the whole thing that I was saying before about um, executive orders and executive orders being ultra vires. And we don't like it when presidents uh, do things that sort of do an end run around Congress. And I'm one of those people. I don't like it. I hate executive orders. But this executive order kind of made sense because Congress wasn't acting, wasn't doing anything. And it was both Republican and Democrat, Democratic problem. It was not, it was a bipartisan lack of action. And so President Obama issued DACA. Um, not to get into the weeds, but in order to qualify, you needed to be here on uh, June 15, 2007. You needed to be here on June 15, 2012. Um, <coughs> you could not have uh, committed any serious crimes other than maybe traffic tickets. Um, and you had to have come into the United States before turning 16. And if so, you were given DACA, which gave you work authorization. It allowed you to go to college. <laughs> Excuse me. It allowed you to um, get a driver's license, and it, it basically it it was kind of like a, a little bit of a safety net. You can never get your green card. You can never become permanent a permanent resident. You can never become a U.S. citizen through DACA. But it was a way to protect people from um, deportation. And again. I don't disagree that executive orders are very troubling. It seems to some people, well, if a president can do this and just ignore Congress, I mean, why do we have the uh, separation of powers? Very true. In fact, we've seen how flimsy executive orders can be because President Trump has challenged <coughs> the legitimacy <coughs> and the constitutionality of DACA. Um, and it got all the way up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court decided they weren't going to hear it this term may go back up to the Supreme Court in the next term, and we'll see whether or not DACA is constitutional. But some lower federal courts have already uh, decided that DACA is constitutional. So it's still an open question. Uh, it's, it's still something, but it does give a little bit of breathing space to people who, in all respects, other than what their birth certificate looks like, are Americans. <coughs> I don't think the people who don't like DACA are unsympathetic. I don't think they're racist. I hate it as a conservative when someone 
criticizes people who want immigration reform, who want security at the borders, who want people to go through the appropriate processes. I hate it when they're called racists and bigots. That's wrong. It's unfair. It's easy. Immigration is not black and white. It's nuanced. And this is nuanced. This is part of the nuance. This is part of the give and take. This is the compromise that has been made. However, I do think, and I applaud President Obama for taking this step. And I do think that the outrage on the right is inappropriate, particularly given the subject matter that we have here. Kids, non-criminals, came in before 16, speak English fluently, want to be Americans. Most of them, a lot of them, want to, uh, what was the word I couldn't remember, Colleen? Enroll, register, enlist. enlist, thank you. I couldn't remember this word before. Enlist in the armed services. OK, so we have DACA on one end. On the other, we have the equally controversial topic of sanctuary cities. Philadelphia is a so-called sanctuary city. I'm not really crazy about the term sanctuary city. It's a nice sound bite, but it doesn't really mean what it says. Sanctuary means you're protecting, it's like, you know, um, what was his name? Quasimodo, sanctuary at Notre Dame. It's not giving you a complete and total protection from the reach of the law. What sanctuary cities essentially are, cities which, whereby the local police authorities will not work with immigration, federal immigration authorities. Immigration is federal. Um, in the sense that if someone is arrested for a crime, that person will be treated equally, regardless of whether he was born and raised in the United States or he came from Mexico two years ago. Some people are very upset about sanctuary cities, about the fact that some cities will not cooperate with immigration authorities when they find out that someone has come into their, um, you know, in their, their radar and they know this person's illegally here. Person hasn't been convicted of a crime yet, they've been arrested, but you know what, they're illegally here. Why don't we tell immigration? There are some reasons. One of them is that if you get the word out in the immigrant community that if you've been a victim of a crime and you call the police and they come and they investigate and they find out that you're illegally here or that your boyfriend who's living with you is illegally here or your mom or your dad upstairs are illegally here, if you think that they're going to arrest them and take them into custody, in immigration custody, you might be less willing to report crime. And so your community becomes even more dangerous because the criminal actor, whether he's legal or illegal, is going to be able to just do what he wants to do. Another reason that the idea of sanctuary cities is, is, is designed to um, protect the community is that if you're a witness to a crime and you're illegally here, you're not going to snitch. You're not going to go to the police and say anything about that criminal if you think you're going to be arrested. So that's while I know that a lot of people who are on the more progressive end support sanctuary cities because they, you know, they, they just don't think that the local government and the federal government should be working together and they want to protect immigrants and what have you. They have their reasons. My policy reason would be I want to keep the community safer for everyone both legal and illegal. And this is one of the ways of doing it. Now, some of you might be saying, what about Kate Steinle? What about the nuns that were killed by the, the drunk driver who had been deported three times and came back in Virginia? What about the gang killings? What about the killings of innocent girls in Long Island by gang members? Very true, very true. That has happened. That is the flip side of sanctuary cities. And it is very legitimate to argue whether, I mean, what is the, the, the cost-benefit analysis? I would say that, statistically speaking, the vast majority of illegal aliens in the United States 
do not commit crimes. And that's not just me saying that. There, there is, I wish I had the documentation for you here, but there is empirical evidence that the most law-abiding people in the United States have their green cards. They're legal immigrants, legal aliens. Um, the next are US citizens. So get that. I'm less of a law-abiding person than one of the people that I helped get their green card. And then you have illegal aliens. And there is an incidence of criminal activity. And you might be saying, well, one, you know, let, let's get rid of any criminal aliens when we have that opportunity. It's a policy issue that needs to be discussed by the legislatures. Um, but I see both sides. It is a very complicated topic. Um, I talked about gangs a couple seconds ago, which brings me to the work that I do 90% of the time, and that's asylum work. In fact, this morning I was at immigration court with a woman from Guatemala who was a police officer who has been threatened on numerous occasions, whose child was kidnapped by gang members who wanted to um, bribe her into looking the other way. And she wouldn't look the other way. So she came to the United States. And she has an asylum case pending. And um, her next hearing is January of 2021. Yeah, shows you how our system is really messed up. Tomorrow, I'm going to York Detention Center, York Prison, where I have another asylum case of a man whose father was a labor organizer years ago. Uh, this man was beaten, was uh, stalked in Mexico. He came to the United States. Um, he's seeking asylum many, many years after the fact, which is problematic for him. The sad part is he has a little girl who is now living because he's been detained for seven months. This little girl is now living with her abusive mother. The reason that my client got picked up by immigration in the first place was that he went to court to seek full custody of that little girl who has been sexually abused. And the mother of the little girl, who is a US citizen, figured out a great way to keep custody. And she notified the immigration authorities that he was going to be in court. York is um, with Luzerne County. That's not a sanctuary city. The police were working with the federal authorities. And they went, and they went in, and they picked him up. And now he's in detention. And the only way that he's going to be getting out is if we're able to get him an asylum grant. And that little girl is living right now with the mother and her boyfriend who allegedly abused her. So that's why it's, it's, it's really, these cases are all gray. They're not black and white. This guy came into the country illegally. He left, he came back illegally, was stopped at the border, was deported, and then came back. And that was in 2001, and he's been here for 17, 18 years now, uh, raising a little girl for the last seven of them. Anyway, so if you're Catholic, say a prayer for me for tomorrow. Um, I've done a lot of different types of asylum work. My cases have run the gamut. I represented a woman whose brother, a woman whose brother, a political activist in the Sierra Leone during their civil war, was macheted to death while she hid under their bed in their house. She came to the United States 20 years ago with a, a, a fake US passport. Um, because she came in with a fake US passport, that made things very complicated. But I'm happy to say that last month, 20 years later, she was granted her green card. So she's here. I have represented a woman from Kenya who was a woman's rights activist, a Kenyan Me Too, who was a woman's rights advocate stripped naked in the streets of Nairobi and raped by people who didn't like what she was doing. She came here and sought refugee status. She was granted that status, and now she's a US citizen years later. I have represented a young man from Albania who was a poll watcher at the first democratic elections held in Albania after the death of Enver Hoxha, the dictator. Um, he was beaten so badly that he lost all of the teeth in his mouth. 
He's a 21-year-old with no teeth. He is now a U.S. citizen. I represented a woman from Honduras whose fiancé was shot to death by a rival gang in front of her and who testified as a witness against the shooter and got death threats. She's here in the United States now, was granted asylum last, uh, last year. I have represented a Maronite Christian from Lebanon who, during the Syrian occupation of Lebanon, of Beirut, was beaten with electrical cords after he had been doused with water, tortured because of his nationality and also because of his Christian faith. He is now here living in New Jersey as a US citizen with three children. I have represented a woman from Mali who underwent female genital mutilation. I don't need to explain. It's exactly what it sounds like. And she sought asylum so that her little girl would not be sent back to, her little girl who's a US citizen would not be forced to accompany her to Mali and have the same thing happen to her that, that happened to my client. And my client is today a green card holder. I represented a woman from El Salvador, a devout Catholic, who was raped. And when she became pregnant by her rapist, he was angry. And he kicked her stomach so hard that she lost the baby. And because she's a devout Catholic, she felt that she was responsible for this. She left, the, she left El Salvador. She fled El Salvador. She came to the United States. And she was granted asylum a year ago this May. There are many more over the past 20 years. These people are the reason that I do the work that I do. It's very nice when people get married to their true loves. And by the way, that show, 90 Day Fiance, or whatever it is, that reality show, that is not the way things really go. And you know, people don't look that good. The one, you know, it's not like everybody's like, oh my god, I'm a reality star. No. And they don't, um, I mean, the women are not as hysterical. The men are not as, I don't know why she's doing this to me. It's, that's, it's a very exaggerated form. But yeah, I do that. And I've done that. It's nice when I can bring man and wife together. And now man and man and wife and wife, because immigration law is federal. And since same-sex marriage is now legal at a federal level, men can sponsor their husbands, <coughs> and women can sponsor their wives and get their green cards that way. That's a whole other story, a whole other lecture. I like being able to facilitate those relationships, but the thing that really makes me feel good when I win is when I can get someone asylum. And the thing that makes me feel really devastated is when I, I cannot get them asylum, either due to my own efforts or because the law just doesn't let me do that, which brings me to Attorney General Jeff Sessions. When he attempted to change immigration policy toward battered women, and victims of uh, domestic violence, it, it angered me because while you know, we're, we're enmeshed and, and, and focused on the Me Too movement here, and, and in some cases, and I will be quite honest with you, and, and I'm not, it's no secret, you can just Google my name next to Me Too and you'll see some of the things that I've written, but I think that in some cases, this movement has demeaned true abuse. I see true abuse among these immigrant women who come here. And the fact that Jeff Sessions would try and say that being beaten by your husband and not having a police force in your country that takes you seriously, the fact that he would say that that is not the basis for asylum is upsetting. That's also low-hanging fruit, just like the DACA people. That's low-hanging fruit. Same with gang violence. I'm currently handling the case of a young man who is gay from Guatemala. He hasn't told anybody but myself and in our office that he's gay. He was being blackmailed by gang members in Guatemala because they found out that he was gay. They threatened to kill him. They threatened to kill family members because being gay in Guatemala is not an easy thing. So he fled to the United States and he has his hearing coming up as well and I really don't know how that's going to turn out but hopefully he will be able to obtain asylum as member of what's called a particular social group. Sorry, I jumped over a little bit of this. There are five ways to get asylum based on your race, based on your religion, based on your um, nationality, based on your um, politics and membership in a particular social group and that's a huge catch-all. So. 
gay men threatened by gangs in Guatemala who have no protection can qualify as a particular social group, or at least that's what we're arguing, and we'll see if the judge agrees. Um, if he went back, if this young man was sent back to Guatemala, he believes, and I believe, that he would risk being killed. He would risk death. I know that sounds melodramatic. I know that sounds like, oh, really? They're not going to be killed. Well, I have another story to tell you. Remember that woman I told you about from Kenya, who was the women's rights activist who was stripped naked in the streets of Nairobi and raped? She had a brother, and his name was um, Peter. And they arrived in the United States a week apart. She came, and then he came, and they came with visas, and they both filed for asylum. Jane, the woman, my, sister, my client, was able to argue her case in front of one judge who granted her asylum, agreed with her, fine. Peter had another judge. The facts were almost the same because Peter had actually been affiliated with Jane in her work. The judge who had Peter's case didn't believe that he was telling the truth. He said, you've filed a frivolous asylum claim. Frivolous asylum claim is like the kiss of death. When you are told that you have lied to immigration, you are then closed off from any other immigration benefit. So we filed an appeal. I told Peter, I said, we're going to appeal this case. And it took a while. And Peter missed his family. He missed his wife and his two little boys. Because he had hoped that if he got asylum, he'd be able to get his green card and then bring them over, or bring them over after he got the asylum. And it was taking too long. And one day, Jane called me, his sister, and said, Peter went back to Kenya. Um, or Peter's on the way to Kenya. And I couldn't stop him. And then I later found out that a week after Peter arrived in Kenya, he was murdered by, I still get emotional. He was murdered by the people that he said would have killed him. I don't really blame that immigration judge. It's not really fair in hindsight. But it does show you that these cases are extremely serious. And when you have commentators on television talking about unwashed hordes of people coming in at the southern border, terrorists. Yeah, there are some terrorists in there. But there are some very good people who just really want uh, a chance <clears throat> at a life in the United States. I believe, and this is my you know, Catholic Villanovan coming out, I believe that there is morality in providing refuge for people like the ones I discussed above. <coughs> I believe that there is morality in trying to keep families together. I believe that there is great immorality in not giving people the benefit of the doubt, people who seek asylum. I also think that there's great immorality in not sympathizing with the families of Americans who have been killed by illegal aliens. I think it's really wrong for my progressive friends to point the finger at people who have legitimate concerns about dangerous immigration, the dangerous aspects of immigration. I think it's wrong to point the finger and say, you're a racist. Racist is such a stupid word to use when we're talking about this topic. It's not about racism, sexism, bigotry. It's about common sense principles that how we decide our national identity, what's important to us, who can help us be better Americans and be a better America, and who should not be here. It's fairly simple. I don't know why I'm not president. Laws are not always moral. I took a course in jurisprudence from the great Willard J. O'Brien, 
dean of the law school when I am here. I'm going to reveal something now. He's not around, is he? He's I'm going to. He's not. Good. All right. I don't think so. I had a huge crush on Dean O'Brien. <laughs> I mean, I had a real crush on Dean O'Brien. I would just like sit there and like sigh. He looked like um, Robert Vaughn to me, who was Napoleon Solo in The Man from Uncle. You're all too young to know who that is, but Google it. And I was just like, hubba, 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 hubba. Um, well, beyond my schoolgirl crush, which you can imagine, I had spent 12 years in Catholic girl school, single sex, four years at Bryn Mawr College, single sex. And you know, I made it to Villanova, and my threshold was pretty low for falling in absolute lust with someone, although he was actually a very, very handsome man. Anyway, beyond that, I loved the course that he taught in jurisprudence. He taught us about the moral foundations of the law and how we as Catholic lawyers could live our faith and reconcile it with our profession. And if I had more time, I would talk about Governor Cuomo, who just signed a very terrible law. And I don't think that he found the way to reconcile his faith with his professional obligations. But again, that's a, they didn't ask me to talk about that here. I could do a whole other lecture on that part. But J. Willard O'Brien, Dean O'Brien, taught me how to measure and balance my faith and my obligation to the law. I think that when I do my asylum work, I'm doing the best that I possibly can to reconcile those two. I also think that I'm doing that when I try and keep Americans safe by trying to, by contributing to efforts to keep our borders safe, vetting the people who come through. That is the intersection of morality and legality, trying to craft laws that embody compassion, understanding, common sense, and also carry with them the appropriate level of punishment for those who have violated the standards of society. I don't have the perfect balance, the solution, um, the mathematical equation for finding that equipoise between compassion and justice. But I do think that the mere fact that we have struggled so mightily and so passionately and for such a long time in this country about the state of immigration and the status of immigrants is an indication of how, at heart, we understand that the stranger can become the neighbor and that the way that we allow it to happen, if it is to happen, um, defines our own humanity. Thank you. Um, and now I'll take any questions that you have. Hello. Hello. My good friend. <laughs> Joe, how do we get paid? <laughs> That's right. He says it's my multimedia career with the paper and everything. No, um, that's a good question. We, uh, it, it's a very good question because a lot of the clients that we have are not well healed. We don't deal with a lot of corporations. We deal with a lot of individuals. Um, and believe me, our fees are fairly low. Yeah, so, um, and, and we have very a sliding scale, and we're very um, generous in the way and the timing for our payments. But yeah, you know, I mean, they, these people work, even when they're not authorized to work, they're working. They, uh, and they have money, and we usually get paid in cash. Cash. Which you do report. Oh, of course. <laughs> you have to. Yeah, like it. Hello. Hi. You mentioned that one of your clients will not have the next hearing. Did I understand that correctly until 10, a couple of years from now? 2021. And I was actually happy to get that date because I thought with the shutdown, it was going to be pushed even farther back. But that next hearing is only going to be like a preliminary hearing. Today was her first hearing. We gave the paperwork to the judge. Three years. So how much of a backlog is, that? is there? Why is there such a backlog? And what happens to people in the meantime? Is she allowed to work? Is 
is he allowed to do anything? That's a great question. There's a huge backlog. There right now, I'm not sure, I think there's a backlog of about 800,000 cases. And what just happened with this shutdown has added an additional 100,000 cases to the backlog. So it depends on the type of case you have. If you file for asylum, like my client did, generally, 150 days after you file for asylum, you can apply for a work authorization. And that work authorization will give you a social will give you the right to a social security number. And so you can work. You can work legally while you're waiting for your case. I have to say something. Um, Jeff Gamage, who is a, a, a reporter at the Inquirer, he does the, in the immigration beat for the Inquirer. And he does a great job. But he wrote a column yesterday about immigration backlogs and about how this was a terrible, terrible thing and this was causing a problem for immigrants. It's true in some cases. It is true. Um, for someone who has an asylum case and they desperately want to get, the, like Peter, if they desperately want their case to be adjudicated so they can get their family over here, that delay is terrible and, and you know, it's, it's, it's crushing. On the other hand, you have people out there who may not have very strong cases. So if your case is delayed by two, three, four years, that's two, three, four years that you have gained in the United States working paying money, uh, paying money, working, making money, uh, paying taxes, maybe, maybe you meet a woman or a man and you fall in love with them and boom, you don't have an asylum claim anymore, you have a marriage case. Or the laws change or something happens. So I emailed Jeff and I said, this is a great column, but it would have been nice too if you had mentioned that part of it where some immigrants are actually happy with the delays. It really just depends on what kind of a case you have. Yeah, very long delays. Hi. Hi. Um, thank you for coming here, by the way. I like want to be an immigration attorney, so I appreciate you. I have my cards. My, uh, my, my boss hopefully remembered to bring my cards, and I will give you mine. You can email me. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Let me clarify that. I don't support the wall because I think it's counterproductive. <coughs> I think that the money would be better used, and you can probably finish my sentence, um, with other alternatives. I think the wall is a symbol, and I, think, I, don't, I don't think it's racist to want a wall. I don't think walls are immoral, as Nancy, Nancy Pelosi said. I mean, you can't have that kind of rhetoric and actually have anything um, uh, concrete and, and you know, helpful. But I don't think a wall is going to help. And all that money to have concrete, or as some, someone said, a beaded curtain. I mean, we're getting to the point where now it's going to be like, you know, what, saran wrap? The, it's not going to help. So I'm sorry, finish. Yes. Oh, yes, 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 yes. We need those judges. My poor judge today, and we have um, five immigration judges in Philly. We just got another one. For the longest time, we only had three. Um, we have five now, and they're wonderful people, and they're really smart. Um, New York has 37, <laughs> and LA has got 100 something. But we do need more judges because, in the case, in, I was here today. And I was telling, I texted Jack to tell him I was on my way because I was worried. I was there at 8.30 this morning. I didn't leave court until uh, close to 11 because of all of the people that were in that courtroom. One judge and there were about 150 people waiting for their cases to be heard. So I absolutely agree with you. Judges, not walls. Any other questions? Yes, when you, when you talk about asylum, apparently that's a good amount, amount of your work. Yes, right. now it is. Um, my question is basically, people come here to escape some sort of wrong that's being done to them. How often does asylum really solve the problem? <coughs> do, do, pe do people still get, I mean, does it, people have to go into witness protection things if they're involved with real high-priced criminal people that can come
come halfway across the world to get them? It's an interesting question. Um, it's an interesting question. I, no, they don't normally need to go into witness protection if they're granted asylum. After you're granted asylum, within one year, you're able to file for your green card. And then within five years, you can file to become a US citizen. Um, there have been cases where people have had to change cities, change their identities, because even if they've been granted protection by the United States, that doesn't mean that there aren't cartels after them, what have you. But I, I'm really not personally aware of situations where someone who has already been granted asylum has, uh, is still in danger. Uh, much more common for me to know that people who have been denied asylum and have been sent back who have, have been killed, who have been injured. You had a question? Um, I know a lot of the cases that you mentioned were asylum seekers. Mm -hmm. So is there a legal way to just immigrate to the United States currently without seeking asylum to people who want to become citizens because they'd rather live here? Mm -hmm. um, if you find a boyfriend or a girlfriend and you get married to them, that's one way. If you have a family member, your mother, father, son or daughter who are legally here, they can um, petition for you. It's called a petition for immigrant relative. If you have, um, if there's a business that wants to sponsor you, if you have a specific skill that um, you know, maybe you are the world's best um, beignet maker or something, you know, you're from uh, Montreal and you have a restaurant down here in Philadelphia that wants to sponsor you, you can get your green card that way. Um, you can come in with a non-immigrant visa, which is a temporary visa, and then maybe segue into a permanent visa. There's a visa called an H-1B, which is for people who have um, the, the job that they're being offered is a job that requires a bachelor's degree, uh, and they also have the equivalent of that bachelor's degree. The, but there's a very um, tight limit on, there's a cap on the number of visas that are available in that category. We've done visas for, it's, called, it's like the alphabet soup of visas. There's um, the O visa is a visa for someone who is so talented in their own country internationally that we're just like saying, yeah, we want you here, come here. We, did, we had a Romanian soccer player who got an O visa to be here in the United States and a doctor doing AIDS research and um, a variety of different O visas. Um, so there's, there's a bunch of ways to come. It's not just asylum. In fact, asylum is probably the worst way to try and come here because you've got to prove that you've been persecuted. Um, hopefully, I mean, no, y you've been persecuted. You don't want that to happen. You've got to prove it, and the bar is pretty high for um, finding you know, that you actually are entitled to it. Okay. Mm-hmm. It kind of tracks a system like Canada had. Right. Yeah. And that will replace the current system right now that basically have most of the immigrants coming to the United States would be just someone who immigrated and start dragging the family over. So would you say, what is your perspective on the base act in general? Well, guess what? I mean, I think, you know, President Trump has talked about merit-based immigration. And I think that that has an absolute definite place in this discussion. I think that we need to look at, um, to me, there are three great bases of immigration. There's the refugee asylum immigration, which is kind of, it's, it's the international understanding that we are all safe harbors for people who are persecuted. That's one. There's family immigration, which some people call chain immigration, which is when you have, you're married or family members, you want to bring them here. And then there's merit-based. And merit-based is often, as you said, based on your education, based on your skills. We already have, in a way, um, sort of like a modified merit-based system with all of those alphabet soup visas that I was talking about. Those are non-immigrant visas, but um, if you can show that you have certain skills and qualities, you're able to get a non-immigrant visa. Or in fact, there are also green card visas that you can get called genius visas based on your qualifications, employment-based visas. I think what they codified in there is a much more 
it's sort of like a menu that you can look at and you can like a mathematical equation match up as you said points for education points for a certain amount of experience and and quite frankly i don't see a problem with that as long as we also maintain visas for people who are refugees and also we have a certain um, limited number of visas for family immigration as well. I think it can all work together. I think we, it doesn't have to be one or the other. It, it can be, that's not a bad idea because we want people who are contributing to society. Um, sometimes though, the people that you least expect to contribute to society are the ones who are contributing um, the most. And in some cases it is the refugees, but I, I don't think it's a bad idea at all. Colleen. I'm not quite sure how I want to ask this question, uh, Chris, but let me try. Um, it seems to me, I, I, I recognize the political football here, mm -hmm. that um, in the sense that some people are concerned that, uh, Republicans are concerned that more flexible immigration, um, there's a tendency for immigrants to register as Democrats. Right. Once, and so, so there's this political business that's tied up with this. But it seems to me that this doesn't have to be a political issue. If we could think past the prejudices on both sides, um, there is a certain moral obligation, it seems to me, um, not a legal obligation, a moral obligation, that is welcoming to the poor, the oppressed. Um, that America's always stood for that. Mm -hmm. And to give that up means to give something up about being American. So that's on the one side, but on the other side, there is something about what it means to be a citizen of a nation. And it's not just to inhabit a land. Right. It's to hold something in common. And it's not just that immigrants coming in don't have that, because right now we're at a, a, a crossroads in the country where we're not sure we who are citizens here have that. Right. But that we need to pay attention to that again, to uh, that there's a certain substantive way to think about what it means to be a citizen of this country that doesn't have to do with race, <coughs> it doesn't have to do with, with religion, it has to do with commitment to a certain idea. Um, what can we do as young people to get past the partisanship of this, to talk about this in such a way that we could come together? Such a great question, and I don't know if my answer is going to be um, as, as good as that question merits. But um, you know, when you, when you say those things, it's interesting, because it, brings me, it makes me think of, again, the, the DACA. We talked about this before. DACA kids are not citizens. They're illegally here. And yet, for all intents and purposes, they have embraced the idea of America. They've embraced the idea of being an American. Again, they are almost indistinguishable from Americans. So I guess at one level I'm saying there is an American spirit. And I don't want to sound like I'm waving a flag or anything. Um, but there really is something that makes us unique. Because we don't have that DNA that makes us Swedes, uh, Italians, Irish. Um, we are all of those things. I'm French, Swedish, Irish, and Italian. Mostly Irish and Italian, a little bit of French and Swedish. But, and I cherish my, my heritage. But I'm an American before anything else. And believe me, those DACA kids, and I'm not pushing this as a political thing at all, those DACA kids marinated in America, in being American. And they came out American. They were like one, two, three, four, five when they came here for the most part. And that's what I think is, is something that you're talking about, that we have an overarching ethos and spirit. Um, by the same token, I agree with you that we cannot simply let anyone in that wants to come in. We cannot. We are a shining city on a hill as Ronald Reagan said, but that city does have limits. And so, and, and to sort of follow up what that young man was saying with um, the Purdue, the merit-based system, we want to bring the best to America because we deserve it. 
and so do the people who are coming here. They deserve a country that is made up of the best people. Um, and when I say best, I'm talking about all the different metrics, inside, outside, brain, heart, um, spirit, ability to work. I think that we have to make, we have to establish that every country has the right to determine its boundaries. If we don't have sovereignty, we're not a country, okay? Um, the way we do it is how we, it, the, the immigration is the way that we do this, we define it. Joe, I wanted you to mention something because um, Joe is, is Italian. Joe is Italian um, because he was born in Italy, but not because he was born in Italy. His parents were born in Italy and his grandparents were born in Italy. And Italy, well actually Libya, right, one of them. Um, Italy follows the law of use sanguinis, right? Meaning that you become a citizen because of your blood, not because of where you were born. The United States follows where you were born. So it doesn't matter what your parents were, you are a US citizen. In some bizarre cases, you can be an Italian citizen, never been to Italy, don't speak Italian, have nothing in common with Italian culture, and become an Italian citizen, right, Joe? Yeah, yeah, you can go, no, your children, though, speak Italian and live there and everything, but I'm talking about someone who had a great grandfather. And because of the way the laws are set up, you can, right, you can actually get your Italian passport. Is a person who's born in the United States, I'm sorry, is a person who's not born in the United States, but came here as a child and is a DACA recipient any less of an American than I am? I don't think so at a moral level, at a spiritual level. Is a person who becomes an Italian citizen simply because some paperwork falls in line, is that person as much an Italian citizen, deserve to be an Italian citizen as Joe or someone who was born and raised there? I don't think so. I think that's my, and I know you didn't ask about birthright citizenship, but in a way, that's why I believe that birthright citizenship is the way for us to go, because at the very least, there's a connection with the place that you were born. And although this isn't strictly immigration, um, I do think that we have a right to demand of the people who are citizens and the people who make up a part of our country some kind of basic understanding of what it means to be an American, civics, know the history, um, have some understanding of the one language that connects us, even though you don't need to be completely proficient, and just understand that it's not wrong to demand certain things of people in order to be able to live in this country. It's not just, hmm? yeah. right, that's what I'm saying, I'm saying, and the laws, but the laws should always reflect that. Yes? How does that reconcile with tourism I, see, I don't like that word, because I know that some people talk about that, and on the radio program that I host, I get people calling all the time about tourism birthing. Pregnant women from Honduras who crawl on their knees across the border, drop that little puppy, U.S. citizen, like Makuna Katata, whatever it is, hold that thing up there, and then go back home. And they've got their little homemade U.S. citizen that later on, 20 years from now, is going to be able to help them in the United States. Can I tell you something? People may want to call it birth tourism. That's a pejorative. So is Anchor Baby. Kids born in the United States can only help their illegal immigrant parents 20 years from now, or 20, right, 21 years from now. It's hard for me, although it might exist, but it's hard for me to believe that someone would plan that far ahead. I'm getting pregnant now. I'm going to go into the country. We're going to go back to Honduras. I've got my citizen child. And then in 21 years, assuming we can you know, avoid the gangs and the shootings and all of that stuff, then we'll have our green card. I, I don't. Now you described the starkest case, but there's an industry in Florida that accommodates Russian mothers. I know it does, but it, but but there's still, it doesn't. Industry, uh, it it does, but to what end? Those babies cannot help their parents until they turn 21. 
there's, I mean, it's, it's like an investment, okay, you know, the investment portfolio in your child. 21 years from now, he can My help you. My question was, how do you reconcile it? It doesn't make any sense at all. No, it doesn't. And people will manipulate and violate the laws, and, you know, once you have a law, someone's going to find a way around it. Sir? Is there, uh, is there some international law here? Are there uh, 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 rights of asylum under resolutions and actions of the UN? Are they binding upon us as a member of the UN? Bingo. Yes, they are, and they should be. And that's one of the reasons why some of President Trump's um, legislation has been found unconstitutional in um, the federal court system. Not all of it, not all of it. Um, the travel ban that was called a Muslim ban by some people was upheld in a modified version. But yes, asylum law is international law. The, um, the convention against, um, con the international convention, well, the international convention against torture is one of them. Um, the, um, the refugee convention, all of those, um, we, are, we are signatories to those treaties, and so our laws sort of track the, um, the regulations that are in the treaties themselves. You're absolutely right. It's international law, which sometimes takes precedence. As um, Anthony Kennedy, Justice Anthony Kennedy and Justice uh, Stephen Breyer had talked about when they were giving their lectures about the importance of international law and its impact on American, American law. Um, so you said that you have, like, if you come over, have a baby, you go back, like, 20 years later, you would be able to come over, but not, like, immediately. Right. But um, what about the problem of people who come over, have a baby, and stay, and because it's, like, a moral dilemma of picking up the parents but keeping the kid there for everyone's mm -hmm. And And that's, that's exactly what we deal with a lot, where you have someone who is illegally here as a parent, um, and they have children. The children can stay. The children have an absolute right to stay. The parents don't accept in certain circumstances. Um, I don't want to get too deep into the weeds on this, but there's something called cancellation of removal. And a lot of my clients know it as the 10-year law. If you have lived here for 10 years, um, you have not committed aggravated felony, like a, a bad crime, and you have US citizen children or a husband or a wife who's a U.S. citizen, and you can prove that there will be hardship to that husband or wife or child, then you have a chance at getting your green card based on what's called cancellation of removal. And that's in 10 years, but you have to already be arrested by immigration for that to be applicable. But yeah, you're right, there is a way. Otherwise, um, in many cases, if a person is deported, the children will accompany the parent, and yeah, they will go back. That's true. I didn't say they were. I said people think there are. Get the tape. I want the tape. We have it. Zabruder it. I want to use to Zabruder the tape. He's my boss. He my paycheck, so he's right. <laughs> yeah, he is right. There haven't there haven't been any documented cases. In fact, all of the terrorism in the United States was um, affected, effectuated by people who came in legally. Sure. When I was born, there were a little over about a billion and a half people who were, I think it was about six and a half billion. Yeah. Uh, kind of in that background, you can't handle for China has finally got it under control. You would probably, you could probably have any problem finding 30, 40, 50 million people who if they could get their hands on the money, get an airfare, get here, and declare themselves requesting status here. There's a limit. <coughs> the country has a right, I think, to limit how many people come in. And those that come in, when my, when my grandparents came here, they had to establish the fact my, my grandfather came first, four years later, my, or whatever it was, he came later. They had to show that they were not going to be dependent upon the government. They were mm -hmm. able to make a living on their own. They would have a place to live, and they were not going to be burdens to society. Right. 
and we don't have that today. We, we do, to actually. $200,000 No, I have to stop you. I have to stop you there. We do have that requirement. It's but called it's an affidavit of... It's, but, it's, but it's not for it. It, 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 it. Well, but don't, please don't okay. misspeak there. But there is a requirement, and in fact, some people can't get their green cards because of that requirement. It's a very strict requirement that you need to show that you're not going to be a public charge. Well, you're, talking well, about, you're talking about people who are using, who are misusing funds. That's, that's one thing. That's true. But please don't, don't misstate what the immigration laws require. But you know what's happening now? But, but you're jumping from one topic. Let me, let me answer the first question. The immigration laws require, it's called the public charge requirement. Um, if you cannot prove that you will not be a public charge and you have to show that someone's going to sponsor you with tax returns and all of this, they won't give you the green card. You're absolutely right. There are people who are abusing the system. There are people getting welfare, food stamps they shouldn't be entitled to. That's a violation of the system. That's them going around the laws. But the laws themselves do require that. Well, I'm not. Well, the thing, the thing is this, and I'm not going to change your opinion, and don't filibuster me. I'm not going to change your opinion, and I don't disagree with some of what you're saying. I mean, have you ever seen anything I've written or listened to me on the radio? What I'm saying is, I think that there's a middle ground here, and I would agree with you. As I said at the beginning, we have the right to determine what our borders are. And it is not racist, and it is not bigoted to say that. And I think it's extremely important to get that out there. On the other hand, we can't misstate what the state status of the laws are. The, if the laws need to be changed, they need to be changed. I would agree with you. But the way the laws are, st are set up right now, they, they, there's an equal poise. There's a try to balance between the people who are here and contributing and who are not a public charge and people who will be left out and kept out. And believe me, with Jeff Sessions and with um, you know, President Trump's administration, for better or for worse, there has been a significant decrease in the amount of asylum seekers, in the amount of people who are eligible for asylum. So, you know, and we're working on it through the system, the legal system. I just came back from China. Mm -hmm. They know where I am. If I went a thousand miles north of China and had automobile accident, and nobody knew it, they, in ten minutes they'd know who I was. We don't know who people are coming here. They get lost in the system, and we can't find them when we have to find them. They should be, but I would never hold China up as an example of a country that I would want to live in. And I would say one other thing to you. <laughs> Remember when you were talking about how they have, um, they have pretty much gotten a hold on their population? You know, unlike, you know, they did that? Forced abortion. Oh, I know. I that was a basis for asylum, so I'm not, I'm not a big fan of China. <laughs> I'm just saying. Thank you. I want to thank Christine for coming here today. Thank you. <laughs>